of uh, my understanding and interest. And uh, eventually met Deepak, became very close friends. And we had uh, uh, mostly friendly debates, mostly really debates about what is natural reality. And um, eventually we wrote this book, uh, You're the Universe, uh, which also we could say you are everything that there is. <laughs> right. Okay, so Menas, let me, uh, you know, we'll bypass a lot of the history. Right. Get uh, to first science and then also we'll get to spirituality. So if I go on Wikipedia right now and I type out uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics, um, I see about 25 interpretations, uh, starting with the original Copenhagen interpretation and John von Neumann's uh, interpretation of the Copenhagen uh, interpretation. So, but there are about 25, 30 theories, right. uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. Nobody argues about the uh, Schrodinger's equation or the calculation, uh, which seems to be totally accurate and is the basis of all our modern technologies, including the technology we're using right now to communicate. So nobody questions the legitimacy of quantum mechanics or its, um, or its uh, technical applications in modern society. I'm told that 70% of the economy is based on this deeper understanding of um, so-called perceived reality. Uh, through quantum mechanics. Uh, but when it comes to the deeper implications, uh, going beyond the recipe for calculations, there are 25 to 30 interpretations. Uh, you are still sympathetic to the Copenhagen and the John von Neumann aspect of it. Can you tell us uh, what that interpretation is exactly? So let's start with the Copenhagen. Um, it is, um, of course, named after the city of Copenhagen because uh, Niels Bohr, um, uh, who is, was, and uh, his uh, institute is still in Copenhagen. I visited actually the institute. Um, it was um, one of the main proponents, not the only one. Um, quantum mechanics, um, and I will stick with the term quantum mechanics, even though quantum physics and quantum field theory is often used. They're not quite the same. Quantum mechanics, uh, the original um, idea was that um, um, the nature of, um, uh, let's say, jumps or energy um, interactions between matter, radiation, uh, comes into jumps, comes into quantum. And uh, that was actually quite a radical idea uh, because um, up to that point, up to a few um, decades before then, we used to think that energy comes always in a continu continuity of, um, of uh, states. So it was really Max Planck um, who at the beginning of um, exactly actually December 19, uh, 2000, <laughs> 2000 to be exact, uh, 1900, and we are now uh, 2020, so we're really 120 years later. So it was Max Planck uh, who was a rather conservative uh, physicist published in um, December of uh, 1900, the idea, which seemed crazy at the time, that energy comes in chunks or in bits, not in a continual way. Um, so what is, um, what is the point about all of that? Uh, it was radical because um, you would have these um, jumps or these um, um, places where you will not find energy. And this, um, we today we know that this is the case with uh, atomic physics, atomic interactions. Make a long story short, um, what um, came about was um, eventually became an extremely um, successful theory. Today we can predict uh, uh, certain quantum properties of, uh, of uh, atoms and of uh, nuclei uh, particles um, to one part in 10 to the 16. In other words, one part followed by um, 16 zeros inversely. <laughs> uh, that's how accurate it is. And this, of course, most um, successful uh, theory of um, quanta uh, is known today as the quantum field theory, uh, the latest one. And quantum physics is a general term. Quantum mechanics was a term that uh, was used back then. I still use that term for historical reasons. So um, what, um, what are the, you just said uh, there's 25 or 30 different versions. They all have to 
give the same examples um, um, in their calculations, give the results of examples that we take from um, nuclear physics and atomic physics. They have to, otherwise they're not good. So the difference is not so much in the prediction of the actual um, physical quantities like the magnetic moment, let's say, of, of, an, of a neutron, or et cetera, et cetera, or the mass, um, um, actually masses do not get predicted, but we can sort of uh, estimate what are the interactions between matter and energy, et cetera, et cetera, um, to a very high degree of accuracy. That's not really what is contested. What is contested is the implications or, or the foundations, or let's say the, um, the interaction of what eventually comes out to be um, the observer or the one who performs experiments and the observed system. In other words, the subject and the object or the observer with um, uh, observers because there, we believe there are many of them. It turns out actually that may be a wrong assumption, the most fundamental wrong assumption. Um, and um, then the system that under question. Um, so this is a sort of a long-winded uh, um, introduction to this whole issue of um, what is the role of obs observation. And parallel or about the same time, um, 1905, in fact, it was Albert Einstein who published the special theory of relativity. And uh, roughly 10 years later, 1915, published the, um, 1915, 1916, published the general theory of relativity, which is, um, equally uh, valid um, and today we know also that it is uh, true to a very high degree of accuracy and yet what the theory of relativity says and what quantum physics says are really totally opposite in terms of the physics even though we know that both of them must be right so this is actually a situation that is not it's not very acceptable in some ways that you have two very uh, robust and um, uh, very accurate theories that don't fit together. So what is the situation? The situation today is that um, what is the role of observation? And, and um, the theory of relativity actually, which is called relativity because it has to do with relative observations of things like the uh, speed of light, um, is they're both in some ways non-classical, so to speak, non-Newtonian, and yet they are so different. And so quantum physics was um, the, going back to Copenhagen interpretation, it was the work of many um, physicists, whereas um, the theories of relativity, pure, uh, relatively pure, today would say Einstein, but there were also, uh, before him, there were other physicists who worked on it. Um, the role of observation comes down to, if I interact with a system, uh, my decisions to what to observe, are they important or they are not important? And the short um, answer to all of this is they're extremely important. And this is what we call the Copenhagen inter interpretation. Actually, the Copenhagen interpretation was put together by Niels Bohr, as I said a little while ago, uh, Werner Heisenberg, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, the list goes on and on and on, um, on one side. And um, uh, sort of counter point of view, which is really that uh, everything is really independently of the observers, uh, would be led by actually Erwin um, Schrodinger himself, who wrote the Schrodinger equation, which is uh, probably the best uh, and easiest way to study quantum physics. Albert Einstein um, and um, later on uh, Dave Baum and uh, equally eminent physicists who actually held the opposite point of view, that, namely that reality exists whether, whether we observed it or not. What but, is uh, John von Neumann's contribution? So John von Neumann um, um, made tremendous contributions, of course also made uh, tremendous contributions to um, what we know today as uh, you know, uh, computing and uh, computer algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. John von Neumann is a great physicist, a great computer scientist. His contribution was um, to sort of state in a, a way that um, was not obvious and is still not obvious that in fact there are two types of interactions or two types of ways that we should look at a quantum system and the act of observation. 
I will talk about active observation or measurement because actually quantum physics, and even today, did not address the issue of the observer. Who is the observer? We talk about measurements. We talk about taking measurements of, um, as I said a little while ago, uh, magnetic moment or different quantities uh, that we measure very accurately in the laboratory. And yet it leaves out the issue of, well, who is the observer or what constitutes an observer? Um, so what I say is that uh, quantum physics opened the door um, to the issue of the mind, to the issue of consciousness, uh, but didn't really, uh, certainly did not close the door and uh, has not even just uh, begun to accept to ask the right questions. And that is very important to ask the right questions because if you leave out the observer, if you leave out the active observation or measurement, as we call it in, um, in physics, then you're leaving out a lot. So this is where we are today. Okay, so let me ask you some questions here, right here, because I, although I kind of now grasp all these intricacies and complexities, thanks to my association with uh, you and people like you, but forgetting, uh, leaving aside terms like collapse and decoherence and all of that, I don't want to enter that, but once you make a measurement, what you observe is a particle, correct? So uh, depending on the choice that you make, um, and these are very simple qu um, choices, they usually actually come down to uh, this or that, either or, <laughs> that, that always comes down to that. Stay with that, let's stay with that. Let's stay with that. A particle has units of mass and energy, right? It's a, a particle has um, uh, actually units, uh, units of many different units. It has uh, quantities that um, are measurable, but uh, they refer to actual properties, what we call actual properties, such as charge, mass, um, energy, um, and uh, spin, things like that, which um, supposedly um, exist independently of observation, independently of what you do. But if I do a wave-like experiment and I see waves, which are complementarity activities, uh, we can say wave and particle are complementarities. Correct. So the wave doesn't have these units of mass or energy or charge. Where do those come from? So the, they come from actual um, observations. So the observation was always part of the picture. It's just that the, it was put on outside or it was pushed, it was pushed under the, the carpet, so to speak, um, because uh, to, many, to many physicists way before Einstein and uh, Niels Bohr, et cetera, um, it actually would open up Pandora's box. Actually, it was Isaac Newton himself, probably, I would say, the greatest uh, scientist of all time, the greatest physicist who did ask some of these questions and to a surprising degree, it came, it came down to, on the side of quantum physics, even though today we say Newtonian physics, but actually Newton um, was really a um, believer that in fact, the, we are part of the, of, the, of the great whole that we're trying to study. Uh, it was not put in such a concrete terms as it, is, it was later on, but it was, it was there all along. So to make a long story short, a wave is something that is not localizable. Uh, it's something like light that presumably extends over infinity of space and time. And um, then uh, today we say, well, when and this is actually going back to von Neumann, uh, when you actually make an observation, um, you get specific uh, answers. And this specific uh, answers is what we call particles. You can, you can have a specific charge of an electron, et cetera, et cetera. And so the specific things is particles. The non-specific is waves. Now, the waves usually we think we think of a sea, um, uh, waves on the surface of the ocean, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're not talking about this kind of waves. We're talking about waves of probability. And as soon as you say waves of pro probability, immediately, of course, what comes to mind is the mind, <laughs> because um, um, probability of what? Uh, and you're talking about waves. Uh, so quantum physics, in a very strange way, it was actually Erwin Schrödinger himself who, uh, you know, didn't like this um, uh, reality uh, question of something uh, 
being real only when you observe it, but his uh, Schrodinger equation is actually about probability waves. So what is waving is something that may happen, may happen, and uh, not definite, uh, definite till when? Well, when you make the observation. So it was John von Neumann who brought in the idea of participation, um, even though, as I said, it existed all, always on the background. And it was Einstein who just could not stomach that, to, just to put it in, in short, uh, uh, that in fact, uh, when you uh, don't look at the moon, uh, the moon does not exist. He said, really, do you believe that the moon is not there when no one is observing it? Well, actually, you cannot answer that question. <laughs> uh, this is what comes down to it. Say, so, well, uh, maybe Deepak is, when Deepak is not there, when Minai is not there, uh, somebody else observes the moon. Yes, that's correct. And then it records, and it pretty much is the same moon that you and I observe. And how long do you play that game? Well, you can play it ad infinitum because you take out all the human observers. Then you take out perhaps all the animal observers or all the amoebas, all the cells. And you still don't have the answer to, is the moon there or not there? So Einstein would ask some very deep questions, but he would not give the answer because I would say, we cannot give the answer to that question. And that is the problem, that we cannot give the answer. We assume that the moon is there when nobody is looking at it. But then the question is, who is nobody or who is anybody? And that's the, the, that's the question of the observer. So a couple of things just based on that um, that I want to bring up because I don't know the actual answers. But I'm talking right now to a lot of cognitive uh, scientists, including Don Hoffman. And yes. Many of them say that observation is not just observation, it's construction. So as soon as you make an observation, you actually construct the experience and different species obviously construct the experience differently. A horseshoe crab at the bottom of the ocean has no access to the light of the moon. And yet on a full moon night, it comes from the depths of the ocean to the surface to lay eggs and to mate and to propagate the species. So it has some experience that uh, we call the moon, but that's a human experience and a human construction. Uh, and the horseshoe crab has its own construction, whatever that is. But observation is not just observation, it's construction. Because uh, what you observe is a narrow band of perceptual activity, that's all. And the human perceptual activity is 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visual spectrum is 1%. And with our instruments, of course, we can extend the range of experience and hypothesize these other aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum, even create constructs out of that. But what we're observing is not what is. What we're observing is what is constructed in consciousness. So that's the first thing that I want to ask you. But the second thing, which is even more important, is where does the energy, where does the charge, where does the spin, where do all these properties of what we call matter, where do they come from? Because the wave doesn't have them. So what is the source of all this energy, charge, and all these things? Actually, waves have parts of them. A wave, electromagnetic wave, has uh, frequency and has wavelength, uh, but they're different, differently thought of than a particle. So the difference between a particle and a wave is the localization, whether you can actually make it very specific. That, that is the main difference, not the actual units and, and not even the, uh, the various um, uh, qualities. Let me interrupt. If you say the waves are probabilities, Right. Then how does a probability create a charge or have a charge? Does the, the probability wave intrinsically possess charge and units of energy? So, so the probability wave cannot create anything. Probability is a mathematical uh, construct that if you observe something, if you observe something, you may get this and this and this and this. So this, this is the point. Um, but you mentioned before um, the uh, participation of the observer. In fact, it was John Archibald Wheeler, one of the uh, also great physicists, 
who call the universe the participatory universe, what in fact, in a way you can say is you are the universe, so we participate. You mentioned that the crab, a particular type of crab that comes to the surface, actually at the depths of the ocean, there are fish that they never come up. They have never experienced the moon one way or the other, yet they're alive. Their sense of time would be different. So as soon as you get to the whole question of measurement, then you say, well, what are your measure? Well, it depends on space and time. But what if, if the space that you're in is infinitely dark um, depths of the ocean, you never see the, uh, the light of the moon you, or the sun for that matter particularly, and yet you have a sense of existence, you exist. So um, existence, it comes down to, it really has nothing to do with um, basic properties that we observe or we measure. Existence is just is, isness or being. Um, what von Neumann did was to ask the question, it was not just, of course, him, it was Bohr before him, and, and since that time, uh, pretty much all the quantum physicists asked the question, uh, well, are these properties there uh, no matter what? And uh, then you measure, you make a measurement and you get a certain probability that you get something and you get some probability that, that um, you're not going to get anything, specific value. Um, this is the measurement problem. And uh, we usually think again, and this was Einstein's point of view, um, Schrodinger, et cetera, is that there are definite um, values associated whether you observe them or not. Uh, this is so um, down to earth, uh, common sense, quote unquote, that we say, well, uh, it must be that way. But common sense um, can be very misleading. You mentioned the electromagnetic spectrum. Actually, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, what our eyes can see, the visible spectrum is not one per just 1%, but tiny, tiny fraction. It has to do with the human eyes, that we can pick a particular part of the spectrum. Um, X-rays and gamma rays, we don't see. Radio waves, we don't see, but they are part of the spectrum. So what we call the reality that we see with our eyes has to do with our eyes. It has to do with actually the human uh, experience of two eyes seeing the visible light. And that's it. That's what it is. If you don't have eyes, if you are a bat and you're flying around without eyes, you still avoid uh, objects uh, as you fly around, quote unquote objects, because you have um, basically a radar, a way to pick objects and avoid them. Completely different sense of reality. If you're a fly, completely different sense of reality. So human constructs of reality are human humanly induced by this body and, this, and the mind. And I say in the mind, of course, you cannot put it in particular location. So this, this is the, what comes down to. And it's still with us, this problem of is reality independent of what we do or is it dependent? It really comes down to this complementarity that you mentioned before, which actually was Niels Bohr. Um, we built on it, but of course it's very ancient. The yin and yang, the, uh, the up or down, the black or white, the plot positive or negative. I don't mean it to assign it particular values, human values, but the opposites and how the opposites really interact uh, with the observer in some ways. Are they fundamentally there or they're not? Yeah, so in all the reading I've done, and uh, I've done a lot, but I'm not a physicist, but I have never seen a definition of either what the observer is or where the observer is located. So going to now our other area of interest, which is understanding consciousness, um, in the non-dual traditions, uh, Vedanta, Kashmir Shaivism, the physical body and the mind are themselves objects of observation. So when I look at the universe, you know, I look at the Milky Way galaxy, I look at the book, I look at my hand, the eye that is looking is actually not an embodied eye. The eye that is looking is a non-local awareness in which the body-mind and everything else, including the universe, are a unified experience in that non-local mind. And the experience, of course, as we just said, 
is species specific, you know, and sometimes culture specific because the lens through which a scientist looks is not the lens through which, uh, say, a shaman looks or a, or a philosopher looks necessarily or a, a religious experience uh, of that. Uh, so who or what is the observer? Is it from, I'm asking you right now, is the observer an embodied observer or is the body mind itself part of the observation along with everything else? So that actually is easy to answer because uh, you, ju you just answer it. I say, is the observer, uh, when we observe, let's say our hand, right? This is the hand. Is, is, it, is the observer the hand or is the hand just another object? We, we say my body. We don't say I body. <laughs> we don't say body, body me or something. You know, that would be a funny kind of English. We say my body. I observe my, my body. I actually thinking with my mind, <laughs> even the mind. We say I'm thinking with my mind or I'm thinking of you. One, one observer thinks of another observer. So the observer can never be gotten out of the, out of, out of the picture. This is what you just said, the non-dual aspect. The non-dual is always there. For example, look at the, the background here. Um, the background is just a blank wall, right? And in your case, your background has all these wonderful pictures, so you know, books, et cetera, et cetera. They are both aspects of the one reality. The mind is the one that actually gives reality to objects. This is very hard to, again, believe. And Einstein would say, well, really, is the moon there when nobody's looking at it? Again, cannot be answered. The non-dual aspect is the background on which duality arises from. But we get caught up in the duality. And they would say, that is reality. Well, it's actually complementary. It's there and it's not there. And the human mind cannot grasp it. It says it's got to be one or the other. It's got to be uh, positive or negative. It's got to be up or down. It's got to be uh, light or heavy. Yet these constructs are nothing more than ways that the observer, and we still have not decided, <laughs> said who the observer is, gives um, himself or herself, and the observer actually it's without a sex, without really specific uh, gender, so to speak. You can think of the observer as it or that, um, neutral, is always there. And then through the acts of observation, which in our case require the five senses, vision, you know, here, et cetera, et cetera, say, well, it has a smell, it has a particular sound, it actually has some visible properties that depend on the sensory input. And then we say, well, I must be the sensory input. But our language itself always says, my body, my mind. We don't say I body or I mind. <laughs> um, we say my body and my mind, or we are sitting together, we are talking to each other. Our language reveals non-duality. Uh, and in fact, in some, as you know, in some languages, past and present and future don't even exist in the sense, for example, in Korean. And I, I know in ancient Sanskrit, um, you can talk about objects without really talking about the um, verb. You know, you can say, um, I think, and you can say just think. And when you say think, actually it implies I think, or we think, or you think. So it's context, it's contextuality that enters the picture. So our language itself um, reveals the truth, and yet we believe that it is objects that make up the truth. Yes, so, you know, again, going back to Vedanta, and our book actually starts with a conversation between Einstein and Tagore. Because exactly. The one was a realist and the other was an idealist, as we know. And uh, Tagore basically was of the view that the universe that we know is a human universe uh, in human consciousness, uh, which is uh, constructed or given a model by human scientists, obviously. And they never uh, agreed on anything between Einstein and Tagore. They were sympathetic to each other's uh, view. In fact, Einstein conceded uh, 
ultimately to, to go by saying science is my religion. He said that science is my religion uh, and he meant it. That was his way of understanding reality. And yet science also, as you know, is an experience in consciousness. We can't do science without consciousness. So science already assumes that there is something that allows science to happen. But this brings up a big conundrum for me, because as you said, um, cosmological principles like the grand, uh, the, the general theory of relativity and uh, quantum mechanics don't match. Uh, if I go back to my teachings in Vedanta, they say knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. They even say reality is different in different states of consciousness. So could this disagreement simply be the modality of observation? You know, if the modality of observation is this, then I come up with grand, uh, you know, general theory of relativity. If the modality of observation is ultra microscopic, I come up with uh, quantum mechanics. There are two different ways of constructing experience. And therefore, there is actually, in the deeper reality, they're both equally valid, as you said. They're both equally valid. And actually, it's, it's the, the funny thing is <laughs> that Einstein himself was an idealist. <laughs> Even though he, he said he's a realist, he was really an idealist. He gave actually in one of, I think it was at Cambridge University, uh, he said that theories are free inventions of the mind. Well, that could be, that was Tagore, right? And free inventions of the mind that actually went even further than Niels Bohr would go because Niels Bohr still wanted to keep the classical appearance of objects. Einstein said, well, it's all mathematical. Well, if it's all mathematical, then it's idealistic. So at the end of the day, what were they arguing about? <laughs> They're asking, they were arguing about different modalities, as you said, of different ways of perception. Um, but Einstein was... Th Interpretation of that, right? Exactly. But Einstein would say it would come down to, well, there is a reality behind all of this. And of course, Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, and Shaivism and all the great uh, philosophical traditions say the same thing. There is a reality. But now what kind of reality are we talking about? Um, to a scientist or to a human being, a common human being, and we're all, we're all co common human beings, we, as, we assign reality to what we perceive. But we just said a little while ago that that is the result of actual our physical body and our mind that comes together. Uh, our mind being non-local, our body seems to be local, although maybe that also is an illusion. And then we say, well, that is the reality there. But the observer is the one who is always on the background. And to give the answer to, to a long-winded question, maybe the observer, what is the observer cannot be answered because the observer is the subject, it's always there. And we assume we, we can approach the subject from the point of view of the object, but there's no way to define subjectivity with objective um, aspects because the objective aspects depend on subjectivity. It's actually very simple. It's our everyday experience. Our language speaks about it. And yet we go about as if subjectivity itself is an object of inquiry. It is the underlying ground. So you cannot get out of it. So again, to go back to what you're saying and reinforcing it, there is only one consciousness, but there are innumerable minds, both species specific, culture specific, and the minds are conditioned by um, history or by knowledge, whether it's philosophical knowledge or scientific knowledge. The mind is a story about reality. So in some of the schools of Vedanta, they say there's only one consciousness. It knows itself through this process called subject-object split. The only way for that one mind to know itself is in fact to create the subject-object split. I know myself as the other. I just call the other the other, but actually myself is both this skin encapsulated uh, ego mind and that 
skin and encapsulated ego mind. And actually, even though you said my body mind appears local, it isn't. Because uh, what I experience as the local body is sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. And none of those have a location in space-time. If I asked you, what is the location of shape? What is the location of color? What is the location of form? The answer is, uh, there's no location of form, color, or shape. And yet, every visual experience, before I call this a book, and this before I call this a hand, before I call this a body, before I call that a painting, it's actually just a color, shape, or form. It's a perceptual activity. And that color, shape, or form is actually very limited because the color I see is not the color, say, um, uh, an insect uh, with a hundred eyes sees or an animal that hasn't, doesn't have uh, cones. It doesn't see a rainbow. So the rainbow is actually constructed in the moment of observation. And so what I'm saying is even the experience of the body is constructed at the moment of observation in the same way as the experience of the Milky Way galaxy or a painting or whatever, the body-mind is part of the whole process and the body-mind therefore doesn't have a location because sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts don't have a location in space-time. So the fact that you see the body as a physical object is actually a total hallucination localized in space and time because in fact, the perceptions don't have location in space-time and they're changing moment by moment. Uh, I look here, I see that, I look there, it's another perception. So I look at my body, I look at the Milky Way galaxy, that's two perceptual snapshots. The rest is a human story. But that is so many million miles away, it's a human story, but the Milky Way galaxy and my body and even the thought about it is all in consciousness. Uh, would you, would that would really solve all these problems? Uh, you know, like what happened, uh, what's at the Planck scale? Why is cosmic inflation so precise? What is the mismatch between the observed value of the cosmological constant and the theoretical value? These are huge conundrums. If you assume that there is an, uh, there's an observer free reality. But if you don't assume that, if you say all reality, is a construction at the moment of observation. And even delayed choice experiments show that, that, you know, uh, say John Wheeler's delayed or that actually we construct the history of the universe right now. And if we can construct the past of the universe right now, we can also construct the future because time only begins when you have a thought. Before you have a thought, there is no time. So what would you say to all this? So, yeah, the, the issue of time is very crucial. Um, we observe something and we say, well, we assume we observe it again and I observe it again. And let's say the book behind you, you know, it has a red color, let's say, right, on the back or the blue that you're just holding. It's a blue book, right? So we say, well, the blue is blue. So Deepak, you also see blue. And you say, yeah, I see blue. But how can I prove that what you see as blue or your blue is the same as my blue? So actually it was Schrodinger himself who said there's no such thing as a color. There's no such thing as a color. Photons or particles of light, so to speak, they are colorless. But we think that the yellow color, um, the blue book, uh, our book, uh, You Are the Universe, has a blue cover, the other book behind you is a red color. We assume that redness is an actual existent uh, property that is there no matter what, but it has to do with the observer. If you are a bat, whether it is blue or red, it doesn't matter. It's an object. You try to avoid it. You know, so um, these are the so-called qualia, you know, the qualities of experience. So we have this qualia and we assume that the qualia are the same for all observers, but not for the bat is not the same for somebody. If we lived around a star that did not emit, um, uh, mostly yellow green light, let's say in the middle red light, then I, for sure our eyes would be different kind of detectors than, the, than human eyes. They will have to pick up red wavelengths and not, not yellow green wavelengths. So um, we assume that things are there no matter what. We assume that the blue color that you see and the blue color that I see are the same. 
but actually it's a conundrum. You can never prove it. This is the point about existence. Then we put it all together and we say, well, the constructs must be the reality. Yes, but the answer is no. <laughs> so it is the exclusiveness that we put on the properties that is a problem. You know, what I see is the real thing. What you don't see is not real. And it has gotten us into deep trouble. Look at what's going on in the world right now, where we say, well, you know, my reality is, is, is the one and your reality must be wrong. The non-dualists or the ancient traditions say, take it, they're both there and they're both not there. The mind says, no, it's got to be one or the other. But actually, our actual experience says, no, when I close my eyes, it's still something is there, right? I don't see the colors. I don't see objects. When I dream at night and I close my eyes, I dream, I see something, but it's not with the visible light. Something else is going on. What is going on? It's the mind. <laughs> it's the mind is the mind. And what you and I actually call the mind, of course, it's not you and I, it goes back thousands of years of tradition and experience, is consciousness, is non-dual awareness. And that is consciousness that creates these minds, but really, truly speaking, there's only one mind, one mind, what the Buddhists call the one mind. The one mind is consciousness. It projects itself like on the screen behind me, which is blank. It's blank because if it already had objects, it would be specific objects. And we assume that the objects are the reality. They are, but they're not the only kind of reality there is. So this here, is the conundrum. Yeah, so here's my experience as a meditator. And I, I know that you're a meditator as well. So right. let me tell you what my experience is. When I have my eyes open, like now, I see what is called a physical world. Okay? But in reality, I see colors and shapes and forms, which are projections of consciousness. The fact that I call it a physical world is a construct based on the perceptual experience I'm having, which is non-physical. The perceptual experience is non-physical. Seeing and colors and shapes and forms are not physical entities. And yet with my eyes open, I assume this is a physical world because I'm translating my experience of perception into the objects of experience. I'm calling my perceptions objects. And before I can call them objects, doesn't matter how small they are, before atoms, particles, force fields, doesn't matter. Before I call it that, it has to be some experience, okay? And that experience is a mode of knowing in consciousness that I then reify as the physical world with my eyes open. But now I know with my eyes open, I'm constructing the idea of objects based on a perceptual bandwidth of experience. But when I close my eyes, actually I don't feel anything physical. I experience phys sensations, I experience thoughts, I experience uh, feelings, I experience uh, images in my imagination. And uh, I might uh, also experience uh, uh, sounds. But you know, with my eyes closed, that's all I can experience. Sounds, thoughts, um, images, feelings, and, uh, and that's it. None of these are physical. And so when I, as a meditator now, I'm convinced that the entire physical world is a hallucination. You know, if, if with your eyes closed, you're dreaming, right now with my eyes open, I'm also dreaming. And it's a lucid dream in what I call a vivid now. The vivid now is not a moment in time. It's timeless. And I am lucidly dreaming. How do I know that? How do I know that? Because what I'm seeing, and I look away and I see again, is not exactly what I saw the last time. Correct. Right? So... Where is the physical world in all this? It's, this is what the Vedanta is called Jagat Mithya. Jagat Mithya is the world appearance, which we confuse for reality, when in fact the world appearance on the screen of consciousness appears 
in the same way as a thought, as the same way as a feeling, as the same way as an image, as the same way as a perception. So actually as a meditator, you cannot convince me that there's a physical world or even a physical body. You say physical body, you say which one? Fertilized ovum, zygote, embryo, toddler, baby. Um, you say, well, you know, if, if, if I was, if physical reality was real, then my experience of it should be constant, you know, but my experience of my own body is not a constant. It's a baby, it's a child, and my experience of the world is it's not a constant. So I, how can I call this, the qualia that we are talking about, they occur at the speed of light or even faster. You know, as soon as the qualia arises, it disappears. <laughs> the only continuity is because you are present in the experience and you give it continuity when in fact there is no continuity to any experience. So, um, very good points. So, in fact, you just said it, um, there is no continuity. And this again, going back to the wave particle. The particle part aspect is, becomes localized. Localized where? Space and time, we say, well, but what is, what is space, what is time? Space is our sense of expansive, you know, uh, underlying, you know, uh, not a medium where objects are found, okay? So we say the in, inside of a jar and the outside of a jar. Of course, it's the jar, right? And you look at the jar and you say, well, the inside, the outside. Physical, when you say, the, when we say the word physical, actually comes from the Greek word physis, which means nature. So when we say physical, we really mean nature, <laughs> natural. So it's not, not necessarily hard. You know, people think of physical as something being hard, but that's hardness. That is, you know, the earth-like or the liquid-like or the, you know, type of, uh, um, you know, fluidity. So we talk about fluidity, solidity, et cetera, et cetera. These are experiences of the sensory system that we call the body. It is the mind of the observer that puts it all together, gives it names, and then comes up and says, well, that must be reality. It is reality, but it's not reality. So when you say, you know, the illusion or the, uh, or the illusion of the, of the senses or something when I close my eyes, what is there is still the experience, but it's not seen with the eyes. In fact, the kind of meditation that I do now because I hang around some Buddhists is meditating with open eyes. And it's, a, it's actually a great experience. You, you see things, you say, oh, it's there, but <laughs> um, what is there? Well, it's also the same thing when I close my eyes, but not, not quite the same because now I don't see colors when I close my eyes. So we project things all the time, quote unquote, and then we get caught in our projections and we say that is reality. We get caught in our own web, spider web of thoughts. The mind, the one mind is the one consciousness behind everything. How many minds are there? You said the word innumerable. The, to put it another way, infinite. Probably it is infinity of infinity. And how do we prove that? You, you cannot prove it. The closest you can come to it is through mathematics. So this is, in a sense, why mathematics is more elevated, quote unquote, because it, it gives us the language tools, the mathematical tools to explore reality. But even mathematics must be housed, must have its base as the underlying consciousness. It is the most refined form, but it must still be housed in consciousness. So we agree, it's just, we get caught in the quality of experience. And the quality, as you just said, are non-space, non-time, non-physical. Um, and we believe that that is our reality. It is and it is not. The mind says it's got to be one or the other. That is what I call the bad habit of the mind, of the human mind. And it has gotten us into deep trouble. And now we're... We don't want to spread fear, but it's gotten us to the point that actually our very existence sort of depends on this faulty experience of it's got to be either this or that, it cannot be both. It's not both at the same time. They are both there as part of the experiencer. 
Okay, that's very good, Minasa. As we conclude, uh, I would like to ask you, why do you think this deeper understanding of reality is important for our liberation, for our freedom, for what the spiritual traditions call moksha, um, freedom from all conditioning and all conditioned minds. Why is this important? So the, uh, these philosophers that you mentioned of all traditions, whether east, west, north or south, they all came down to, again, the experience. And it's, it's, uh, it's timeless, it is uh, traditionless, um, even though we, we give it name, the Indian tradition, the, the Greek tradition, the Western tradition, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the question as to why is a most fundamental question. Uh, it really comes down to the uh, non-dual, or what you call the Advaita, the non-dual aspect that you just cannot get the... <laughs> the being, the existence out of the existence. You cannot get it out. <laughs> we assume that it's not there uh, because we close our eyes, but actually there's something there. So it is the illusion of projecting onto the screen of the mind and calling the projections the real thing. The same way that when we look at the TV screen, we think, oh, well, there's a human being there. Well, no, it's nothing more than uh, dots. <laughs> it really is, um, you know, uh, light and darkness. That's all they are. And then we, we are now fancy. We sort of just darken, um, darken different shades of darkness. We have colors. So we have beautiful colors. They're all experiences. What the issue here is that, and this has to do with, with survival, is if we don't step back and say, well, you know, after all, it is us who are projecting all of this. And people will say, well, it's sacrilege. What do you mean? We create the universe? Yes, we create it all the time, all the time. We create time, we create space. And then we think that, oh, it must exist there because I close my eyes, I open my eyes, I close my eyes, I open my eyes. It's the same experience. It's the experience is the same to a certain degree in a probabilistic way but it's not there if I don't have eyes. It's so obvious. You know, people uh, have eyes and then become blind. Can you say, well, now they don't exist? Of course not, they exist, but they exist in a different way. The dangerous game we're playing is that we exclude everybody else's point of view. And now it has gotten us into deep trouble. <laughs> So I was recently revisiting Atma Bodha by Shankaracharya. Correct. It's a very short text, right? A few verses. But he starts off the whole Atma Bodha with a very simple statement. He says, enlightenment, enlightenment is removing the veil of ignorance so that you can discover your innate divinity. And uh, I think that says it all, that the spiritual practice is removing the veil of ignorance, which is all the projections that camouflage or veil the reality of innate divinity, which is present in all of us. Would you agree with that? I mean, we are, we are talking about Shankara right now. Right. It's, uh, I totally agree. And in fact, this so-called spiritual uh, traditions, we, uh, we assign religion to it, but religion really it's, has nothing to do with it. I mean, we, religion is something that we construct, which is fine, and it's great, but then we say, well, it's the same thing as spiritual. Spiritual comes from this word spirit, right? So the point about, about reality, these great philosophers, these ancient uh, seers, sages, they were actually very realistic. <laughs> they were talking about be here, be reality. The first verse, the first of uh, the Shiva Sutras, it says, um, uh, basically, consciousness is being, being consciousness. The, it doesn't even have the word is in it. It says being consciousness. What exists is consciousness awareness. And so they were very realistic, the realists, and we think of them as idealists. Of course, reality and idealism are, again, words. Ideal comes from the Greek word, you know, 
uh, idea. <laughs> it's the same idea, right? Which is really um, the um, background of existence. That's what it comes down to. But then we associate ideas <clears throat> with experiences and we say it is the experience which is the total reality. It is part of reality, it's not the total reality. And that is the important point. This is where complementarity enters the picture. Yin and yang, object, subject. The one behind even the object subject division is the observer. Even behind the object subject duality is the observer. And that you cannot define. It's the experience itself. But not the specific experiences. <laughs> Well, this has been a very enjoyable conversation. I am thinking of a title for this talk because we can also do maybe some articles on based on this talk. So if you like, I would like to call this uh, quantum mechanics and reality, colon, your body has no location and the mind cannot be found. Correct. Body has no location because which body are you talking about, right? Uh, Dream body. <laughs> your body has no location and your mind cannot be found. So what's going on? And quantum physics gives us a clue. How do you quantum, quantum physics said, well, it's the observation. It's the act that, that and of course, this is what the great uh, yoga said all along. It is the actual participation. It's all the same. But we consider this and that and we separate ourselves. So you're good with the title, right? I do go with title, right? It's okay. good. This yeah, non-local. It's non-local. Okay. Your body has no location. Your mind cannot be found. And quantum mechanics is a clue to that. Exactly. And, and ancient traditions are the clue. What, where was our body before we were born? <laughs> before the sperm and the ohm got together? Where was our body? And then we think that it is our body. Now, where is it now? Which one are you talking about? Exactly. The zygote for this one. Yeah, actually, our body, as uh, you and I know, is made up of 100 trillion cells, which change all the time. In seven years, the cells, most of the cells are gone, except these the cells of neurons, right? Actually, no. I was even even those atoms. So the brain that remembers learning the English language is not the brain that learned the English language. Oh yeah, of course. Yes, right, right. But there are some cells that last longer. Okay, bones last a long time, but even those, they're made of calcium and they're, you know, they're made of the elements. Sorry. Then eventually gone. We see the dinosaurs, you know, millions of years ago. They're just skeletons. Where, where are the dinosaurs, right? But we put together very carefully, scientifically, how a dinosaur must have looked like. But that was six... It's two humans. Two humans, 60 million years. Dinosaur looked like to another dinosaur. Exactly. But actually, there were, there were no humans back then. So it, so it's all in the imagination. And that it's is all the imagination. Including the Big Bang. Including the Big Bang, particularly the Big Bang, you know, <laughs> particularly the Big Bang. Actually, uh, you, you know, Big Bang came from, uh, um, you know, um, Gamow, who sort of, um, you know, and uh, said there was a Big Bang. And of course, it was Fred Hoyle. And, uh, you know, we're making fun of it. The steady state people and said, well, actually, it was a Big Bang. And all of a sudden, everything came together. Well, actually, no, <laughs> that's the beginning of time, quote unquote, because we associate time with the birth of our body. And we're so tied to our body, we're worried about the death of our body. But I, you and I keep saying, what about before the body was born? Where was it? <laughs> if you want to know where you go afterwards, answer the question, where were you before you were born? And non-existence is not an experience. So what people fear as non-existence is something that can never be experienced. There's only existence and that existence is not in space time. Therefore it's timeless, eternal. That's who you are. Exactly. And then existence is the background, the screen, the one mind, but we take the projections as a real thing. Like when you look at TV and you look at face and say, Oh, Oh, my goodness, look at that guy as a warrior. And you look at, uh, the, you know, a movie taking place and we get shocked. We get, you know, absorbed. In ancient Greece, the developed theater 
precisely to separate the observer from the observed. So you're sitting back and you see the worst crimes taking place, you know, Oedipus Rex, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You see the worst things happening, but you know, they're not real. It's, it's a play, right? It's a play of the theater. The whole universe is a play. And we get identified with the play and we say, the play must be real. But we are the authors in a collective way, not Deepak Chopra as a human being, not Minas Kafal as a human being. Collectively, we put together a story that we call the universe. We get caught in it. We forget that it is the background of consciousness itself. So philosophy is really very simple. It's the same thing as science. They say the same thing. And then Tagore and Einstein argue, or Niels Bohr and Einstein were arguing about something that cannot be argued. <laughs> this has been a very enjoyable conversation. I thank you. Same, same here. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch. Locally. Thank you. Locally. In non-dual awareness. <laughs>